Professor David Gunnell um, is Professor of Epidemiology at Bristol University, um, specialising in adult mental health and suicide issues. Uh, he's involved in various initiatives uh, about suicide prevention and reduction around the world, um, including working with the World Health Organization, where he's been a member of two of their suicide prevention strategy groups. And he leads the International COVID-19 Suicide Prevention Research Collaboration. And then our second speaker will be Michiko Ueda, who is Associate Professor at Waseda University in Tokyo. Um, and she's been a lot of time in the US. Her PhD is from MIT, uh, and she's also previously taught at Syracuse University and at Caltech. Uh, and she too is a specialist in suicide prevention and public health, public policy, and has recently been publishing a number of articles about mental health and suicide issues during the current pandemic. So this is the timeline. Um, they're going to speak for about 20 minutes each, and then we will open it up for Q&A. And we may run the Q&A on a bit beyond one o'clock, um, up to about 1.15 maximum, I think, just depending on how, how many questions you will have. So that's my introduction done. I'd like to pass over to Professor David Gunnell to start us off. So, so thanks very much, Jason, for those kind words and to the Daiwa Foundation and Michiko for inviting me to speak here today. I'm going to give a start with a brief overview of suicide, the epidemiology of suicide, its frequency around the globe, and then move on to talk about what is known to date about the impact of COVID-19 on suicide and suicidal behaviour. I'm an epidemiologist and public health physician. Um, and we look at events, rates of death at a population level. But it's important to recognize as we go through the talks today that each individual suicide is a tragedy for a family, for a partner, for a group of friends and workmates. So first of all, a few words about the global epidemiology of suicide. Every year, WHO estimates around 800,000 people take their own lives. That's one death every 40 seconds. This picture here shows 800,000 people, an estimated 800,000 people attending Kansas City Royals World Series baseball title celebration in 2015 in Can Kansas in the United States. And just gives you a, a sense of the global burden of suicide. Suicide's the second leading cause of death amongst 15 to 29 year olds worldwide. We often think of, or we'll talk about suicide in terms of an iceberg of distress, an iceberg of emotional distress. For every suicide death, an estimated 20 people will make a suicide attempt. So behind those 800,000 suicide attempts, suicide deaths worldwide, there are an estimated 16 million hospital attendances following a suicide attempt. That figure of 20 attempts for every death varies from country to country. And it's estimated that at some point in their lives, around 5% of people will make a suicide attempt. Many more people experience serious suicidal thoughts. For every person who makes an attempt or acts on their thoughts, three to 10 people experience serious suicidal thoughts. And so if you, go further down the iceberg there, you're talking about 160 million people worldwide experience suicidal thoughts every year. Probably that's an underestimate. And of course, the factors that lead to those suicidal thoughts, such as depression, substance misuse, life events, such as relationship breakdown, debt, uh, physical health problems are far more common. The incidence of suicide varies tremendously around the world. This, this map here, this map from WHO, shows how the rates of suicide vary three to fourfold across different countries. The darker shaded areas are the areas with high suicide rates. So uh, the former Eastern Bloc countries, India with rates of greater than 15 per 100,000 per year. And those lighter shaded areas have got rates of less than five. 100,000 per year. And you can see from this that uh, the UK and Japan are somewhere in the middle of that range. Rates in Japan are somewhat higher than they are in the UK. What factors account for these differences? Well, we don't know entirely. 
Some of the differences are likely to be due to the social acceptability of suicide in different religions and cultures. Some of the differences are likely to be due to differences in levels of substance misuse. Alcohol in particular may account for the high rates in the former Eastern Bloc countries. Differences in the prevalence of serious mental illness are clearly important, as are socioeconomic differences as well. So turning now to COVID against that kind of background of the global epidemiology of suicide. I looked up the figures of the number of COVID deaths uh, on Monday and noticed that over 3.2 million people had lost their lives to COVID um, since the onset of the pandemic. And if you like, that puts the number of suicide deaths in some degree of perspective, the 800,000 I mentioned earlier. But there are legitimate questions around the impact of the pandemic on suicide, and perhaps particularly the public health measures that are put in place to offset the uh, spread or prevent the spread of the pandemic. Questions such as what will the impact of COVID-19 be on population health suicide, on population suicide rates, population mental health, and what can the suicide prevention community do to reduce that impact? This is an area not without speculation. If you look at the bottom right of the slide here, you can see a newspaper headline that came out in the fairly early days of the pandemic, flagging concerns about rises in suicide attempts in California. This is one of many speculative headlines. And over the last few months, we've all become used to hearing the word tsunami um, and epidemic and tidal waves associated with concerns about suicide and often times those concerns have been used with political motivations but the, the true answer is we don't know what we didn't know the answer to the pandemic what the impact might be here are a few of those other headlines and if you look at the bottom the slide here you'll see that the doctor making that claim um, about the pandemic's effect on suicide attempts um, was later to be found out not to be telling the entire truth. And I think that's an example of how sometimes politicians have used concerns about suicide to promote the, their concerns about public health responses to mitigating the effects, concerns about uh, lockdowns. So what do we know from previous pandemics? Well, the answer is it's not a lot, really. This slide here um, is an analysis um, I recently did with some colleagues from Taiwan looking at the impact of the 1918 to 1920 flu pandemic on suicide rates in Taiwan. And it's been a similar study looking at this issue in the United States. The red line on the chart here shows uh, suicide numbers between 1910 and 1920 in Taiwan. And you can see marked seasonal fluctuations. The blue line. Uh, with those two peaks up at the end of 1918 and the beginning of 1920, are deaths from pneumonia as a result of the influenza pandemic. And it's important to note the difference in scales. The scale for the suicide counts goes up to about 100. The scale for the influenza deaths goes up to about 8,000. So you're seeing many, many more deaths as a result of the influenza pandemic. And if you look carefully at this slide, you it's pretty hard to detect any particular impact of the uh, influenza pandemic on suicides in, uh, in Taiwan. Using statistical approaches, in fact, we detected a small rise in two of the months just after the pandemic was easing in January and March 1920, with a 30% rise in suicides in just those two months, leading to an estimated total excess of suicide deaths in Taiwan of around 30. Similar findings um, from uh, the United States, where this was looked at. More recently, the impact of the SARS pandemic um, was looked at in Hong Kong and Taiwan, the 2003 epidemic in those countries. And there was a suggestion from Hong Kong that suicide rates rose amongst the elderly population in that country. So the knowledge base on this issue in the international research community was, was pretty limited. And to help people from different countries understand the likely impacts on suicide, to gather early intelligence on the impacts of the pandemic on suicide and suicidal behavior and share that knowledge internationally. We formed the International COVID-19 Suicide Prevention Research Collaboration back in around 
uh, March, April of last year. We've got about 41 countries uh, involved in this collaboration, and my co-speaker, Michiko Wada, has been one of the absolute stars of the collaboration. Um, and the amazing real-time data coming out from Japan has been a real highlight, I think, of this collaboration and knowledge sharing. When we put our heads together and thought, well, what, what are the possible impacts? What are the factors that we should be concerned about that may influence suicide rates during the pandemic? Well, we were concerned about the impacts of social isolation arising from physical distancing or social distancing. We were concerned about the impacts on frontline health and social care staff and frontline workers. We were concerned about rises in domestic violence and alcohol misuse when people were living in close proximity and were feeling stressed. The impact on the economy is important, and I'll say a little bit more about that later on. In terms of young people, we were concerned about interruptions to their education and the impact on their mental health of concerns about the future. And of course, there are concerns about rises in bereavement arising from many deaths from COVID and the complicated grief arising as a result of difficulties mourning in the conventional ways and being with loved ones as they approach death. And there are also concerns about how the media report the pandemic and how sometimes media reporting can heighten anxiety, create links between uh, factors happening in the community and suicide rates that may, people who are, may make people who are already feeling vulnerable much more vulnerable. So one of the things the collaboration has done has been to work closely in, with the media and uh, produce guidelines about the safe reporting of suicide at a time when everyone's feeling stressed. So what do we know so far? about the impact of the pandemic on suicidal behaviour. In England, early data were published just last week, actually, by Lewis Appleby and his team from the University of Manchester. This slide here shows trends in suicide rates from 10 areas in the country with real-time surveillance centres in place for the three months before the onset of the pandemic, January to March, and the seven months afterwards, up to October. And you can see quite clearly from this, this line chart here that suicide rates over the period after the onset of the pandemic haven't increased in, uh, in, in England in these 10 areas. And the, the group also compared rates with rates in the same areas in 2019 to overcome some of the seasonal uh, differences in suicide that occur and found just the same thing, no evidence in these 10 areas of England with real time surveillance in place of a rise in suicide rates. So what about the international picture? Um, Jane Perkis, my colleague on whose picture appears on the left of the bottom left of this slide, has led a group of over 70 international researchers to pool knowledge from around the world on, um, on suicide rates from those countries that have available to them um, real-time surveillance of, of suicide. So a group of about 70 researchers drew together what data was available from 21 countries, and in fact, from 35 areas within those 21 countries. And the countries that took part in this pooling study um, included countries as far apart as Ecuador, uh, Australia, the United States, uh, Japan, um, uh, and England. And this slide shows the results of that study. It's quite hard to, to navigate this slide, and I apologize for it. Um, but the, what we've done through careful modelling is compare the observed suicide rates between April and July of 2020 with the number of suicides that we would have predicted would have occurred in that time period if pre-existing trends in the previous years and months had carried on. So what we're doing in this uh, slide is comparing the observed versus the expected number of deaths. The line down the centre of the chart and each dot represents the findings from a particular country or region uh, is the line where of the ratio of one where there's no evidence for rise in suicide rates. Each area where the blob is to the left of the, the line is a country where suicide rates were lower than predicted. So the number of suicides during the COVID period were lower than might have been expected to have occurred based on pre previous rates. And you can see from this slide for the 16 high income countries we looked at and the areas, the 21 areas within those countries, you can see that um, 
for most countries, the, the blobs or the, the centers of the, uh, of the risk ratios for, it, for each country lie to the left of that line indicating a, a risk ratio of one. So the overwhelming evidence from this slide is that there's been no rise in suicides in the early months of the pandemic. These are all high income countries in this slide. The next slide shows data from uh, five low income areas, Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, and Russia. And the same is the case here. Most point estimates of the risk ratio lie to the left of that line, indicating no evidence for rise in suicide rates. The one area where the, the rates are higher or to the right of the line, this ratio of 1.78 is a region of Brazil, relatively small population, small numbers of deaths, six actual deaths, three predicted, and the margins of error around that risk estimate are very wide. So these are findings up until July 2020. If we extended the follow-up period to October 2020, there was actually very little difference. We based our primary analysis on uh, figures up to July because we thought those early suicide rate estimates would be the most reliable. And um, we thought that perhaps if we went closer in time to when we did the analysis, some of the suicide deaths might have been missing from uh, particular regions. So, so we extended the period up to October, October 2020, and that led to very little difference in our findings. The exceptions were Japan, Vienna and Puerto Rico, which appeared in that analysis to experience increases in three areas, the Thames Valley, Victoria and Mexico City, where the evidence suggests there were falls in suicide rates. What about suicide attempts and self-harm? This slide shows trends in um, hospital admissions for self-harm and suicide attempts in France. Um, for the first 35 weeks of 2020, the red line, compared to the first 35 weeks of 2019, the green line. And you can see from this slide that during the pandemic period, the first confinement in France, there was a fall in hospital admissions for self-harm and suicide attempts, quite a striking fall actually. Similar findings uh, when we look at data for uh, two areas in England, Oxford and Derby. We see that the solid line there, marked 2019, shows trends in hospital admissions um, in those two cities um, between January and June 20, 2019. Each of the bars represents a data point for 2020. You can see a fall in the number of hospital attendances for self-harm in the pandemic period compared to 2019. So people have suggested that may simply reflect people's um, unwillingness to go to hospital at a time when there was an increased risk of infection, perhaps from attending hospital. But the data on those two slides of hospital attendances from France and England are supported by population health surveys. These are data from a big UCL study led by Daisy Fancourt of 60,000 people who've been surveyed um, once every couple of weeks throughout the period of the pandemic. And these show no rise in self-reported uh, self-harm. Uh, over the period of the pandemic from the 30th of March up to the 1st of March. And similarly, studies carried out in general practice um, have found no evidence for rising consultations for self-harm. So the findings for self-harm seem to be consistent for those for suicide. A few words of caution, these are early data. They may change as the pandemic uh, progresses. We're concerned about the impact of a post-pandemic recession. There's some evidence from the data that some groups may be more affected than others. For example, women, people from ethnic minorities, and low, in and low income countries. We know very little about the impact of the pandemic in low income countries. The data I showed were based on either high income countries or high middle income countries. So big concerns about India. And while suicide rates may not have increased, there's clear evidence that levels of mental distress have. The slides again from that big UCL based survey of 60,000 people show fluctuation, fluctuating levels of depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms over the course of the pandemic. So why have suicide rates not, not risen? Possible explanations are an increase in social cohesion, 
during the pandemic, people may receive more support from their family, their friends, neighbours and communities. People may draw together in the face of adversity, a phenomenon seen with suicide rates during both world wars in England and Wales. The economic protection measures may have worked. We were really concerned about um, loss of income and it, it may be those have been protected. Likewise, support from services and charities, although changed, may have been enough to help people through this period. So I'm coming to the end now. Whilst early indications appear reassuring, in high income countries at least, we will only get a clearer picture over the next few months as research findings are published. We learn more about what's happening as the pandemic has progressed and as countries have gone through second waves of the pandemic. The long-term impact of the pandemic on the economy and the well-recognized heightened risk of suicide during economic recessions, as well as potential risk associated with long COVID are a cause for continuing concern. The slide here shows trends in GDP, a mark of the strength of the economy since 1955, so over the last 65 years or so. And you can see the impact on GDP of the pandemic, if you look at the right side of the slide here, you can see the big fall in GDP growth in the last couple of quarters of 2020. If you go further back on that line, you can see the size of the drop in GDP rise that occurred during the 2008 recession. And that puts into some context the change in the economy um, uh, that has occurred in, during the time of the pandemic. And there are strong associations between periods of economic recession and suicide rates. This is a slide taken from a 1951 publication shows trends in unemployment um, in the 1920s and 30s mapped against changes in suicide numbers over that same period of time. The dotted line of the number of people who are out of work, the solid line of the number of suicide deaths, and you see strong parallelism between those two lines there. So to sum up, whilst levels of distress, depression and anxiety have risen during the pandemic, suicide rates and hospitalizations for suicide attempts have largely remained stable or indeed forward in the early phases. We need to get better data from low income settings to understand the impact of the pandemic in those places. We need to continue to monitor the situation closely as concern about the long-term effects of the pandemic on the economy and of long COVID on mental health. We need continued surveillance and good quality, ethically conducted research to inform what we do going forward. And it's really important that governments put in place strong economic measures to mitigate recession effects. So with an apology about the technical problems, I, am, I hope you've heard me clearly throughout most of that. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, David. Okay, so let's go straight on to Michiko to tell us what's going on in Japan, because I think there are some special features here. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, David, for the introduction. I wish I can say that the, this, the declining trend has continued in Japan as well, but unfortunately, I have to tell you the bad news. So in today's talk, I'm going to go through just to give you everybody a quick overview about suicide in Japan, how it's different from other countries, and then also give you some background about the COVID situation in Japan as well, and then tell you how the the number of suicides have increased in the second half of 2020, especially among women. And I give you some explanation, potential explanations for the rise and it also got some implications for other countries. So the quick overview of the suicide rates in Japan. Suicide rate is the number of suicide deaths per 100,000 people. So the, the highlighted ones are the Japan and then UK. You can see that the Japan is one of the countries with a high, very high suicide rate among the OECD countries. This is as of 2016. So this is a, this is a much longer period. This is from the 1978 to 2019. You can see the up and rises. And then when I started studying suicide, that, that was about 10 years ago, the number of suicide deaths in Japan per year was more than 30,000. That's a huge number. But luckily, we have seen a very rapid decline in trend. And then as of 2019, it was slightly more than 20,000 per year. 
although it's still quite high, but you can see that very declining trend. Now, two things. So this is, this is a suicide rate by sex. You can see what two things that you notice. The male suicide rates, as in any other countries, it's much higher. It's about twice as large compared to the female suicide rate. And then also I would like to draw your attention to the late 1990s when we had the Asian financial crisis, the Japanese economy was going quite rapidly got worse in that year. And then you can see the huge increase, about 35% increase among men's suicide. Now, this is important because in the past, when there's an economic crisis, it's the men's suicide rate that increased, not women's. And then also another thing that you might notice is, again, is the rapid decrease in recent years, about seven, eight years after the big earthquake, the number of suicides had declined about, again, 35% until 2019. Now, what happened during the COVID? But first of all, let me just give you some background for those of you who are not from Japan. So we had a quite early cases. What we had an early case of COVID that was in mid -Jan January, and then you might, some of you might remember the Diamond Princess, the cruise ship in Yokohama, and then we had a large case, and that's when people started to, you know, discuss COVID. But still, back then, that was not super super, you know, crisis. The major crisis, or the people started to realize the COVID is a serious one when the prime minister suddenly declared the school closure in early March. So in Japan, it's, it's like mid-February or early March is the beginning of COVID. We had a state of emergency a couple of times. This, we are in the middle of the third state of emergency. And the first one, first one was the major, most major one. And that happened in April and uh, late. May. Now, one thing about the state of emergency, we didn't have any lockdown. It's completely different from what other countries have experienced. We didn't have any lockdowns. We didn't have any strict movement restrictions. Stores are open. You wouldn't believe if you walk around the streets of Tokyo that we are in a state of emergency, even back in April. Although the air was just, people are very tense back in April last year. We are in the middle of a state of emergency, but this is the third time, so people are a little bit more relaxed. Again, the first one was the major one. So you might want to keep that in mind when, we, when you look at the, the increase in the suicide rate. Again, this is a number of cases. This is Palmyrian, the first one, and the middle, middle, middle of the third one. You can see the up and rises, but this looks kind of may look big, but the, compared to other countries, I'm showing you a, 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 as an example, the UK, the number of cases in the UK versus Japan, compared to other countries, the Japan, what we have experienced is very, very mild in terms of COVID cases and the number of deaths. For your information, the number of deaths that we have so far due to COVID is about 10,000. Then the number of suicides that we had in 2019 was 20,000. Now, this is what happened during COVID. So the, this one shows the, the data from the 2015 to March, 2021. The shaded area shows the period of COVID. And then you can see, and then we calculated the, what would be the predicted number of suicides each month based on the past trend. Again, you can see the declining trend. We take into account all the seasonalities and the declining trend. And the red one is the actual number of suicides. You can see there's a clear difference between the predicted or the past trend and the actual number of suicides. So it's a clear deviation from the predicted number. And the one thing that's very noticeable about this increase is the increase is mainly due to the female suicides. This has never happened in Japan in the past. So clearly something is happening. Something very different is happening right now. Oh, but to give you a little bit of, uh, sorry, the interpretation. So that in the past, so for example, the past three years, the number of female suicides is about 500 on average. But in 2020, in the second half of 2020, that in increased even up to 900. It's a large increase. Now, even if you look at closely by age group, it's the mainly among the young, relatively young women that's driving the increase. The October one that as, we as I discussed later is a little bit of an outlier, but up to October, 
among the increase was mainly among women and if you look at october every age group among women is increased and especially that even those those among less than 60 years old the number of suicides by then even doubled compared to the past three years this is by sex and occupation so you, one thing that you noticed is the number of student suicides have increased especially among female students this always breaks my heart but the, but one thing that you might want to keep in mind is a number absolute number in terms of absolute number student suicides are smaller compared to the say the M unemployed or employed but the biggest trend big picture that you should keep in mind again is that the, it's the female suicide that's increasing and then also that it's the students that's also showing a very different trend from the past now in summary so what we have had is compared to 2019 that's pre-covid the number of suicide deaths have increased 912 but again the the increase was mainly by women the number of suicides by women increased by 935. The number of suicides by men even decreased by 23. So, well, it, it's very unusual. And uh, I have been trying to understand what the, why this is the case. There are multiple factors. We don't know for sure. And especially because the data is still limited, we don't have access to individual data until then. We can only look at the multiple factors and then provide the best possible um, explanations. So I give you some potential explanations, but I really want to emphasize this is not the definite answer. And then also the fact I want to emphasize the fact that suicide is a very, very complex phenomenon and everybody dies for different reasons. It's very, it's, it's almost dangerous to oversimplify the cause and the motivation. But still, I can offer you some explanations. So I'm going to go one by one. One is, for sure, is as David said, it's the economic consequences. The COVID is very different from the past economic crisis in the sense that it targets certain industries very, very hard. And then also, the, unfortunately, these industries that were hard, hit hard were the, those uh, mainly served by women. And then also the job losses were concentrated among non-permanent um, jobs, especially in Japan, and these non-permanent jobs or precarious positions are taken by women. The, the figure shows that the, the size of the non-permanent um, workers in Japan, you can see that among women, most many of them are non-permanent and they don't have very stable positions. This one shows the changes in the number of workers compared to the previous year. For example, if you look at the 2020, I'm comparing the same month in 2019. And this is the left hand side is the pre COVID, and then the right hand side is the during COVID. You can see the significant reduction in the number of workers. This is among female, female non permanent workers. And of course, that doesn't mean that they are you know, permanently and, and employed. Some of them may have found jobs since then, but you can see the impact, the size of the impact. Now, if you look at the male or the, even the female permanent workers, it's not, the picture is not like this. Some of them even increase the number of the workers, have, the number of workers have increased. Now, what are the consequences of these or this economic impact on the mental health of the general population? So I have been taking a survey of general population since April 2020, conducted that monthly until the February of 2021. And then we ask a bunch of questions. We measure the depression, anxiety, and loneliness, and among others, to monitor how they are doing during COVID. I use the PHQ-9 for the depression. And then the PHQ-9, for those of you who fam are familiar with the measure, the ninth item contains the suicidal ideation. So I also talk about that too in today's talk. And GAD-7 for anxiety disorders. I mainly talk about the PHQ-9 or depression symptoms in this today's talk, but the tendencies are almost the same for anxiety symptoms. Now, first of all, I want to show you how the mental status, uh, health status have deteriorated during COVID compared to the pre-COVID period. Uh, first of all, if you could focus your attention on the green dots, these are the pre-COVID, the level of the prevalence of depression, the moderate to severe forms of depression 
before COVID, that's 2013. This is not taken by me, but some other researchers. But you can see that it's less than 10% of the population, regardless of the age group, have moderate to severe depression. Now, if you look at the red dots, these are the during COVID taken by my survey. You can see that the number is much, much bigger, especially among the young, relatively young population. So the one thing that we should keep in mind is that the, it's the young generation, the young individuals who are mentally uh, affected by the pandemic. Now, if you break it down, not just by the age group, but the, by whether the, their financial situation, or we ask in a survey whether are you worse off compared to the previous year. And for those the individuals who said, yes, they are meant, sorry, the financially worse off compared to the last year, the mental health status is much, much worse. For example, for those aged 19 to 39, 45% of those who are struggling with the financial concerns have severe, moderate to severe depression. You can confirm this by looking at the employment status as well. Obviously, for those who are unemployed, laid off from work, or taking a leave, temporary leave of absence, have much, much worse mental health status compared to, say, full-time workers or the retired. Another thing that you might notice is the student is also experiencing uh, not so great a mental health status as well. This is suicide ideation, so the, how suicidal they are. So this is a percentage of those who are suicidal, again, by the financial status. But again, those who are experiencing the financial, not just hardship, but the, they think that they are worse off compared to the last year, they're much more likely to stay, say they're suicidal. Of course, we should keep in mind that the, not everybody who are depressed or suicidal would die by suicide, but this is just to show that the, those are the high risk individuals. Now, as these data show that the mental health, the conditions of the Jap Japanese general population has been quite bad during the, the COVID. So the, the underlying condition was quite bad, but there are a couple of unfortunate incidences in Japan that may have contributed to an increase as well. One is a celebrity suicide. So there were very two prominent, at least the two prominent celebrity suicides in Japan. One was in July and another one was in late September. They were all famous actors and actress and nobody have, would have expected that they would die by suicide. And some people even believe even now that the, some of the, especially the actor was killed or murdered by somebody, some conspiracy. Now we know for, 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 for almost for a fact, not just in Japan, but everywhere in the world, if there's a prominent suicide reporter in the media, the number of suicides in the general population tend to increase and the effect is immediate and it, it's quite long lasting. This is the data from the, my earlier study in, in Japan. And then we, as you can see, the zero here is the day of the reporting of the celebrity suicide. And you can see there's a immediate jump in the number of suicides among general population is about five to six percent on average and in last about 10 days. This is again the average. So th these pro two prominent cases that we had in 2020, it could have been had a much larger effect. Now we also had the subsequent studies on this and we know that the when people, the, the subsequent increase in the number of suicides only happens when people are interested in their death they, and they, they talk a lot about it on Twitter. And then also when people find them very surprising, unexpected, and that's when the increase happens. And unfortunately due to these two, these two cases that we had in 2020 just fit these descriptions very well. They are very surprised. People are very surprised. People talk about it all the time. And unfortunately that could have contributed to the, the large increase, especially the second case in October, given her death was end of September. Now, I'm just going to skip this. This is just to show you that the, you know, the, the people are reacting to their death. And then I, I can talk about this later on if you're interested. Another thing that we should keep in mind is, as, is the school closure, impact of school closure. We have the school closure only once. We, they started in very early, early March, and it lasted for three months. 
Now, its impact on students, we still don't know quite yet. But we have seen that the rise in the student suicides, and then also if you look at the mental health status, they are not doing great, that's for sure. My study confirmed this, and then there's study from other teams that confirmed the same tendency as well. Now, the thing about this is it's not just a student. Some caregivers, especially female caregivers, have to quit their jobs or reduce working hours because of this sudden school closure, and it lasted for three months. And especially in, in, in Japan, the housework and then also the childcare burden disproportionately uh, fall on women. And this shows the number of hours the female parents spend on child caring versus men, male, the husband. It's, it's, it's very different. Okay, I should wrap things up. So the conclusion, so as David suggested, in early months, the number of suicides may have declined. And that's what we have observed actually in Japan as well. But it can go up when people started to face the reality of declining economic situation and some other um, issues in their lives. One thing we know from the experience in Japan is the high risk groups are relatively young women economically vulnerable individuals and students. So I'm going to skip the last part. We can discuss it later if you want to. But the implications, what we can, what we can conclude from the experience in Japan, that unfortunately what we have experienced in Japan could be applicable in other countries as well. In many, many countries, women tend to have, as in Japan, employed in the industry hit hard by the pandemic, had the less stable job and the they are less likely to have a very strong social protection. And then they spend this disproportionate time on childcare and elderly care. And therefore, some people have to give up and then leave their labor force uh, participation. And it's really difficult to go. Sometimes it's difficult to go back to the workforce. Another thing, obviously, is the school closure, not just in Japan. We only had it once, but some countries had it for a long, long time. And its impact on students, not just the young ones, but even the college students, and then also its caregivers, has to be very, very carefully monitored. So that's what the experience in Japan suggests. Okay, I stop here. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and, and thank you, of course, to our two speakers, um, really two of the world experts on this particular topic. And we're very glad to have had you um, to talk us through it. Um, so um, that's going to be it for today. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.